Well hello and welcome to this week's sermon video. Uh, taken from a slightly different place today, we are at home self-isolating with uh, uh, COVID. We're all fine here, not going too bad at all, but uh, we don't have the tree, the plant as we usually have, so I thought I'd put the plant onto my shirt uh, instead. And uh, Now hopefully that isn't too uh, distracting as we make our way through this morning. Uh, but this morning we are going to look at the four characters in the gospel text that we've got uh, in front of us uh, today. A text where Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem. He has set his face to head in that direction. And he encounters these pressures on him. He has the death threat from Herod behind him. Uh, and the response of Jerusalem uh, laid before him as he makes his way to that city. But Jesus in this text will state uh, the course he will take, even though that will also have its own violent end to it. But it is the course that God has set for him. And he continues to commit uh, to fulfilling that course, as we will see. Now, all of this reminds me of a movie. I don't know. It's a bit of a theme at the moment, maybe for me. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but the movie it reminds me of is The Dark Knight. One of the best Batman movies you will ever see. Maybe even one of the best movies you will ever see. I encourage you to go and have a look. It's pretty dark. Uh, a lot of great themes going on there to get your he heads into. But a bit of violence too. So just a, a, a warning on that. Now in that movie you have multiple characters. Uh, you have Batman of course. You have the Joker, his kind of nemesis. Uh, that tries to pull him down and work against him. You have Harvey Dent, who is the district attorney. And ha Harvey Dent really is this kind of public good guy. He, he is the face, the, uh, the image of the one who is cleaning up the streets, even though Batman is doing the work behind the scenes a as part of that. Uh, but he is the one that's bringing criminals to justice and, and getting them off the streets and all that sort of thing. But then he, and it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but he goes bad and kills uh, some people as part of that. It's in the end of the movie that Batman himself decides to take the blame for Harvey Dent's crimes uh, so that the public doesn't lose face in the civil servant and, and the good that he has done earlier uh, isn't completely lost. And that's the, 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 the price that Batman, I guess, is, is willing to play. Uh, he is crucified, as it were, in the public image. Uh, but the good of the city, the good of the people, is upheld. Uh, and there's this quote at the end of the movie as the police are tracking Batman down to try and find him for these crimes, uh, arrest him for these crimes. It says this, Because he's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. So we'll hunt him. Because he can take it. Because he's not our hero. He's a silent garden, guardian, a watchful protector, a dark knight. Now, I won't go as far as to say that Jesus is the dark knight. Uh, but in, in, in the dark knight story, Batman actually ends up escaping the police and isn't brought uh, to any form of justice. But Jesus, uh, like Batman, will not be pushed off that purpose that he has to go to Jerusalem, even though he knows the response that he will get that they will treat him like a criminal, that he will bear the crimes of others on his own back. Uh, Jesus is the saviour that Jerusalem needs, uh, but not the saviour that they deserve, as we will see from the response that they give uh, to Jesus. Now, that, that kind of just sets the, the general kind of scene of, of what is happening at, at this point, the general scene of the gospel uh, story. The four characters in the gospel text are Pharisees, Herod, uh, Jesus himself, and the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and as we look at each of those, I want us to think about how it is that we uh, can stay on the course that God sets for us uh, in the face of, pre of the pressures that we might encounter ourselves. Now, directly before this passage, in just a bit of immediate context, Jesus has just been teaching about how uh, we are to enter through the narrow gate. You can read that from verse 22 if you'd like to. Jesus is basically saying it isn't enough to be an acquaintance of him. Uh, we talk, we, you talk in our streets and you ate and drank with us, the crowds say. But we actually need to be willing to follow Jesus along the path that he is taking, to do what he is willing to do 
and to face the consequences of that. That is what Jesus is calling his disciples to. So let's start now with the Pharisees as our first characters, as the ones who begin the text. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to and came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now we have this image of the Pharisees as being the bad guys and the ones that always have it in for Jesus. Uh, but in this case, I think these guys are, are sincerely wanting to warn Jesus of a real threat that they have heard. Uh, they are not necessarily against him, and not all Pharisees in the Gospels were against Jesus. Uh, and it is a real threat that they, they bring to Jesus. We know that Herod has already arrested and beheaded John the Baptist. So this is a real threat that Jesus must uh, uh, take seriously, or uh, it is a serious threat that he needs to uh, th uh, respond to. And really, I guess the the voices, uh, the, the Pharisees represent the voice of reason uh, to Jesus, the voice of logic, of common sense. And it's very similar to, to Simon Peter, as we looked at last week, uh, when Jesus declares that he will go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die, and Simon Peter takes him aside. No, 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 Jesus, this can't happen to you. It's a similar kind of uh, thing that's happening uh, for Jesus. Uh, and it, what it is, is it's this kind of generally accepted wisdom that you avoid, you avoid death at all costs, really. Death is not going to achieve anything for you. Uh, it makes no sense. Uh, this is going to be an interruption to what you're trying to do, do, Jesus, amongst us, your ministry and all of those things. It is the commonly held wisdom, the common sense. But Jesus, as he responds to Simon Peter, uh, the same goes, you do not have uh, in mind divine things, but human things. That is where you have set your mind, Jesus says. Last weekend we watched the movie called Soul Surfer, which is based on the true story of a Christian girl uh, who's a surfer uh, and loses her arm in a shark attack, but continues to surf uh, and to um, have a great ministry for God. Uh, and it, but it's interesting to follow the story because there are moments that she has of, of true despair at what has happened and questions uh, God and, and when what has happened and how can this be part of God's good plan for my life? Um, all of those things. There's a series of events that take place that help her to reconsider that and think through that a bit in a, in a different way. She goes on a mission trip uh, to Thailand and sees some of uh, the things that people have gone through there. And there's this point in the movie, I don't know if it's true to life, but she's surrounded by a journalist after winning a surfing competition. And someone asks her, would she, would she wish that that never happened to her? Of course, we don't want difficult things to happen to us. But her response is uh, that she has been able to embrace far more people, uh, embrace uh, far more things with one arm than she ever could with two. Uh, an incredible uh, view that she has on what has happened in her life and what God is doing currently uh, through her life. I wonder how it is that we view uh, negative things that happen around us or to us. What is our view of those things? Sometimes it's actually the dark and difficult path that serves God's purposes, that can continue to serve uh, God's purposes, uh, as Jesus himself demonstrates. So let's go to Jesus next. Jesus says in response to the Pharisees, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Jesus is basically saying, I will continue on the purpose given for me for as long as intended, regardless of what the threats are against me. Regardless of popular wisdom, regardless of the option to escape, uh, that which lies ahead of me, either in the, the death threats of, Therod, of Herod, but also in the responses that he will face in Jerusalem, where, which uh, in terms of outcome are no different. As I thought about this, and, and Jesus' uh, way he responds, get, tell that fox, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm about. Uh, do you know who came to mind for me? And it's a little bit controversial, I know, uh, but Winston Peters came to mind for me. Uh, there was this, uh, you, you know the character, you know the character obviously, but there was this AM show interview of Winston Peters recently when he went to the protests uh, and they were asking him about that and why he, why he was doing that and all those sorts of things. And whatever you think about the protests, whatever you think about Winston Peters, 
he has this ability, uh, which I think uh, is worth uh, thinking about, to not be bullied by the media, to not be swayed by the media and what they think. Uh, he, he won't be swayed by them in an interview situation. He will stick to what he believes is the issue of the day, even challenging the media themselves when he does that. He has this ability to stand up for things that even if they are unpopular or go against popular, uh, go against the status quo of the day, he will stand up for those things, regardless of, uh, you know, huge opposition to the contrary. And I think as Christians, we can learn something from that. We can be guilty of worrying more about causing offence and being unpopular than we are about holding to the truth. Now, this doesn't mean we have a free pass to be obnoxious and get up people's noses. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that. But when we uh, face threats or persuasions or opposition, what is our primary aim in those contexts, in those situations, when people are against us uh, or, or bringing contrary views uh, to us? What is our aim? Is our aim to appease people uh, or to acquiesce and to follow their way out, uh, to take the easier road, to take the easier option, the, the common sense approach? Or is our aim actually to seek out what the truth is in that situation? Uh, to, to continue to commit to doing what is right, uh, even if that may, may be unpopular with others, even if we have a, a force of persuasion against us. Next uh, in, our, in our characters in this text is the city of Jerusalem. In these words, Jesus says about that city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I guess the city of Jerusalem is the cultural center of Israel and epitomizes that really. It embodies and promotes the leading attitudes, the ideas, practices, behaviors and the institutions of the nation as a whole. Now, it's not that everyone thinks in that way. Uh, of course not. Jesus has huge crowds following him and, and disciples that want to be part of what he is doing. But Jerusalem really is this kind of flashpoint uh, where the message of reform from Jesus contrasts with the kind of accepted beliefs and practices of the day, the kind of zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, uh, encounters uh, Jesus. And we may see that in our own uh, time as well. And so what Jesus does is he recounts the kind of negative history of that city in relation to the prophets and those God has sent uh, as messengers uh, to that city. And one commentator talking about the history says this, that the people are guilty of working with their own definitions of faithfulness, even when these definitions are contradicted by God's own agents. In this way, they establish how far they are from understanding and embracing God's purpose. Man, that, that is a real challenge. It's a real challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for the church uh, continually to be aware of that. Where are we at times working with our own definitions of faithfulness and, uh, and not listening to contrary voices uh, that are actually trying to guide us and, and, and realign us with the Spirit of God in our time. What do we do with that word that contradicts our own position on something? Now, of course, any word that is given uh, from whoever it is given in the life of the church or in the world, we have to weigh and consider and to think through. Uh, but we do need to check ourselves, to check our opinions and our views, to hold those lightly. Uh, so that we have the, the ability to disregard them uh, if we find that they are contrary to what God is saying. Uh, to disregard those things that hold us back from hearing that word of God, whether it's our pride uh, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, do we have that ability uh, to hold those things lightly in order to hear what God might be saying to us? Uh, in this text, Jesus longs for that. Longs that... and, and deeply desires that Jerusalem would be like that, that would hear the word that God is bringing to her so that she may be saved, uh, so that she may 
come on board and join God in what he is uh, intending to do, this great thing that he's intending to do. Jesus finishes off by pronouncing this kind of form of judgment against Jerusalem, that if we don't, uh, that if she doesn't respond to that words, uh, th that word, her house will be left to her in effect, that Jerusalem will be left to her own devices. Uh, she will be allowed to continue on her way uh, that she has set for herself. Uh, and that, that's also quite a challenge for us. How do we discern that, that we have been left to our own devices because we haven't responded to God's voice? It can't be that things really go bad for us because we know that is Jesus' own experience as he sought to uh, follow the purposes of God for his life. But maybe uh, there is a point where we, we feel a lack of guidance, a, a lack of direction uh, from God in our lives. We don't know where we are heading with God or we're not hearing that direction that we may have heard in the past. Uh, we don't have that sense of him confronting us or speaking to us as much as we have. If that is the case, if we're not hearing clearly uh, some direction from God, and um, we, don't, we don't always have that in our lives, but we may need to retrace our steps and ask ourselves, where is it that we stepped away uh, from God's purpose uh, and aligning ourselves with that? We need to uh, come back to those practices of reading scripture, of sitting under God's word and allowing that to speak to us, uh, allowing that to change our minds, uh, committing ourselves again to carrying out God's word, even in the, in the small ways of, of the scripture for the day and whatever that may be for us, discerning God's word and committing to doing that. Finally, we have this image of the fox uh, attached to Herod. Uh, and it's interesting with the image of a fox because it can mean different things in different places and different cultures. Our mind goes straight away to the crafty and cunning uh, image that that would be normal for us to think of. Uh, it's usually a negative image, uh, uh, that image, but in some cultures it can be viewed positively. Of course, it's not intended to be positive in this sense. Uh, to fox someone is to trick them or to deceive them. Uh, that certainly is true of Herod. Uh, we know that in the story of the wise men, uh, where he tried to trick them. A fox can also be used to describe an attractive lady. Probably not the case uh, in this instant. We can be uh, sure of that one. Anyway, generally what we're saying is that we can't assume uh, immediately the meaning that is used for this term. Uh, we have to take it from the text. It's interesting in the Song of Solomon. Uh, that it is the little foxes that spoil the vine. And I think this is quite true of Herod. Uh, one commentator puts it this way. Jesus pegs Herod as a varmint in the Lord's field, a murderer of God's agent and a would-be disruptor of the divine economy. That is true of Herod. Herod is working against God and maliciously so uh, for his own selfish ends, really. Uh, and this does pose a real threat of what Jesus is wanting to achieve, of spoiling the vine, the work that he is doing. And for us as, uh, as a church, we always need to be conscious of, fox of foxes who are actively working against what God is doing for their own ends, for their own purposes. Uh, we ourselves can be guilty of being foxes at times, and we need to be conscious of that. Uh, is what we're doing in the life of the church in our own lives to serve God's purposes or is it actually for our own ends and what we can get out of it? We need to be conscious of that. If things are happening in the life of the church in our lives that are malicious uh, and really are just for personal advantage, that's a sign to us that they are likely contrary to what God is wanting to do. So the question then is how do we respond to that? Well, as we look at the text and, and, as, well, and how Jesus responded, we simply state and affirm what God is about, what God is doing in our lives and in the life of the church, what his purposes and intentions are for us uh, and for the world. And it really doesn't matter who the fox is. The simple uh, statement, uh, reaffirmation of God's purpose, of who God is, what God is doing, it, it, that is a powerful and revolutionary act in and of itself. And it's a biblical act. 
There are plenty of examples throughout scripture where God's people simply stated God's purposes into different into the different situations in which they found themselves. And you can probably think of a whole lot of examples where that was the case. We need to simply state this is what God is doing and to continue continue to restate that uh, as Jesus himself did. Today I am doing this, tomorrow I'm doing this, and this is what uh, this is where I'm headed. Uh, that's not only good to state that um, out into uh, the world and to those that would oppose us, but it's also good for ourselves to remind ourselves of what God is doing amongst us uh, and his purposes for us. So to finish on that, on God's purposes, and really that is the work that we need to be engaged in as a church, uh, engaged in the work of discerning what God is at, about at the moment in our present uh, in our present lives as individuals uh, for us to discern and to continue to think that needs to be our key our primary thing that we're thinking about all the time what is God doing amongst uh, in my life and how am I committing myself to do that to restate that to commit to uh, fulfilling that but also uh, for us as a community discussing it amongst ourselves together to continue to work hard that we're not being deceived and we're not being tricked. Uh, we're not being caught up in the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the age. Uh, but we are uh, listening to God's agents among us, God's prophets, uh, and discerning in those voices uh, the leading of God. Shall we pray? God, you promised to be with us as you were with your son, Jesus not only in the good times, but also in the trials that we face. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bring clarity to the issues that we are dealing with at the moment as individuals and as a church. And would you show us your way that achieves what you are wanting to do among us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.